Hello, hello everyone. Hi, this is Dr. Faith B. Israel and I am here doing a quick live. I know I haven't done one of these in some time. So I'm here doing a quick live where we will be discussing uh, the new domestic violence, the new domestic violence um, act in Trinidad and Tobago. If you are seeing this, uh, please share the live, share the live, share the live. Um, I decided to do it after, I mean, of course, we've been seeing all of the horrible, horrible, horrible news recently um, about the, um, like the lady that was murdered recently and there were all of the complaints about the parents and the family going to the police and blah, 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 all of that stuff. So I wrote an article about it that was published yesterday and I decided that I would do a little live just to speak about the um, what the new law is because I am fearful that because we've done not a such, such a not so good job at dealing with domestic violence in the past, especially from the policing um, standpoint and from the everything, judicial system, everything, we've done such a not so great job at it before that I, I thought it was good for me to do a live to talk about the fact that we have some new laws, which is good, some new laws that are amazing. And um, so that we all know what is happening. So please share the live, share the live. Hey, Shaquille, you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Evangeline, good evening to you too. Good evening. Share the live. Let me do one more quick thing while I am at it to also share in some of the groups that I am in. Um, so yeah, go ahead, share. I'm going to jump into it because I really don't want this to be a very long live. I don't want it to be very, very long. I just want us to jump very quickly into the law so that you know what the rules are. You know what the new legislation says. You know what the, the, the you know, what you can, what you can't do. What are some of the new definitions that are around that we probably didn't know about before? Yeah, so, uh, hi, Laurie. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. So we are just here talking about the new legislation and the new rules as it relates to the um, Domestic Violence Act in Trinidad and Tobago. So I am going to jump right into it. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, hope you are not too stressed about the budget. I'm not even have a, going to have a discussion about the budget. Hope everything is just fine. Hope everything is good and we can jump into this. All right, guys. So, um, Trinidad and Tobago, okay, so very quickly, we have our Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, which is our lawmaking body. Um, the Parliament is the group that they get together. We see them on Parliament Channel. We see them having these very exciting discussions um, continually, but it is the place where laws are made in Trinidad and Tobago. And at the last, just before the elections, we were able to kind of throw in this last um, bill to become a law, which is really to amend the uh, to amend the Domestic Violence Act. So as it says here, it's an act to amend the Domestic Violence Act, Chapter 45, um, Part 56, to provide for emergency protection orders and for other related matters. And I have highlighted. So what you'll see is as I go along, you would see that I have parts of the act that are highlighted because those are the things that I think are critical for us to look at. And those are the things I think you need to see. Um, so I'm going to highlight some parts and then we'll go through. Again, I did this for the um, public health ordinance where we had to, you know, wearing a mask now became a law and you could get fined if you don't wear the mask, blah, blah, blah. And I want to, you all, to encourage you all not to be scared as it relates to um legal documents. Yes, some of the wording is kind of 
boring, but it's really not that difficult to look at. All right, so it was assented to in the, on the 3rd of July. What does that mean? That means that after they went to the parliament, after they did all of the debating, after they went to any joint select committee or anything like that, that they finally agreed and they finally passed it. And now that they passed it, the president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago basically put her signature on it. So the fact that the president put her signature on it means it is no law. It was assented to on the 3rd of July, 2020. So this is now the law that influences or affects how we respond to domestic violence um, issues. The act um, laws usually have several parts. We have the part that talks about what the name is, um, what's the short title, and usually there's a part that talks about what the um, what words mean, so that everyone is very very clear that when we say we are talking about this or that, this is what we are talking about, and that is what we are talking about. There is no ambiguity. So there is usually a section where we talk about what the different terms mean. And because this act is actually an act to amend um, an act that was there from years before, what it's going to do is you would recognize that it does not really have full sentences. It does not really have all of the things very clear. But what this document does is basically say, OK, you see, in the old document, when you see this word, we're pulling out something. We are repealing it. We are removing it. And we are replacing it with this other term or this other word or this other concept. OK, so that is what is happening. So as you see here, we have adoption order, adult, which means everybody over 18, care order, children court, children's attorney, children's home, and their definitions for all of those. But I want to pay particular attention to this first one, which says it's highlighted in yellow, dating relationship, because this is a new term. This is a new term that has now entered into the legislation of Trinidad and Tobago, a dating relationship. So what does that mean? It means a relationship where the parties do not live together. So that's clear. They do not live together in the same household, but may engage in romantic intimate or sexual relationships. So they classify dating relationship, and I highlight this here because it's in sequence because there are, um, there are parts of the law later down that speak about dating relationships. So they wanted everybody to be clear when they say dating relationships, this is what they are talking about when they speak about a dating relationship, right? So it is uh, a relationship where the parties do not live together. That's critical. They don't live together in the same household, but they engage in romantic, intimate, or sexual relations, all right? So that's critical. It's also important to understand the term domestic relationship because this is also another key term that is relatively new to this law, relatively new to the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. Domestic relationships. And what does that mean? A domestic relationship means the relationship between a respondent and a person. So a respondent in this setting is the person who is responding to the claim. So um, I am in a relationship and I am claiming that I am being abused and there are definitions for the different kinds of abuse. But I am claiming that I am being abused. The person who I am saying is abusing me, so my, my girlfriend or my boyfriend or my wife or my husband or whoever, that other person is classified as the respondent. The, I am not the respondent. I am the one who they consider as the person in this law. All right. So between a respondent or a person where the person is in a relationship to the respondent and that relation to the respondent could be a spouse or a former spouse. And these are some of the things that are important and these are some of the things that are new. So for example, it could be a spouse, meaning somebody who you are married to now, but they've now made provisions for a former spouse, meaning somebody who you are not married to or you are not married to any more. Right. So this is one of the new things that's been added. Um, when they say domestic relationship, it means somebody who's a spouse or a former spouse. And let's go through. It also means somebody who is a cohabitant or former cohabitant. And that term cohabitant um, is defined below basically as somebody who's living in the same space with you. 
It could be a child, and a child is somebody who is under the age of 18, according to the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. It could be a dependent, meaning somebody who depends on you, somebody who you have legal obligation to take care of. So uh, um, anyone could be a dependent, a child that's living with you, a relative that's living with you, somebody else that's living with you, where you are the one, in essence, providing financial and other kind of care for the person. It could be a relative, and this is another term down that is defined, who is a relative, or it could be a person who has agreed to marry the respondent, whether that agreement has happened or has it, or whether it's been terminated. So just the fact that we agree to get married, whether we actually got married or not, um, means that you are in a, and the term is domestic relationship. So as you see, we have, um letter so this first one all of that refers to a so a domestic relationship means a relationship between a respondent and a person where the person is and all of the things that i just spoke about or we could go to which includes a spouse or former spouse a cohabitant or former cohabitant a child a dependent a relative or a person who agreed to marry whether that wedding actually happened or not B meaning it is uh, the person is in a relationship to the is in relation to the respondent meaning the person is in a visiting relationship or the person is in a dating relationship and both of these terms are again defined below. All right. Now, as you see, we did not in Trinidad and Tobago have concepts of visiting relationship before. And I think we all know what a visiting relationship is. That is you and somebody, all you're together a long, long time, all you're in a relationship, you're not necessarily living together, but all you're there forever and ever. We all know them, the man and the woman who we thought they was married first together so long, but they're actually not even married. They are um, courting, but the courting is very long. Uh, they're not necessarily living together, so the person comes by you, maybe spend a night, you go to the person, spend a night, and that kind of thing. Those are visiting relationships. Or the person that's in a dating relationship, meaning you all aren't boyfriend and girlfriend, or you're not committed, but you're still dating. So this person, this person can also, as we would see a little later down, can also go to the police and say, hey, I am being abused by somebody and the law now takes that into consideration, even if you are not married, even if you are not a relative, even if you are not a child, but I am in a visiting relationship or I am in a dating relationship with that person. C says, would be a relative of a, of a respondent related by marriage. So basically, um, if you and somebody were to get married, and because of that marriage, you are now classified as a relative of another person. So you are now an in-law, a mother-in-law, a daughter-in-law, a cousin-in-law, or whatever in-law you are now, if there is any kind of abuse happening Within that, you also can now go to the court, go to the police and make a report and that has to be taken into account. A member of the same household as a respondent or the applicant, so you just could be living in the same household. A child in common with the respondent, so you all have a child together. You all, there is no other, there is no other definition for what is happening between both of you other than is my baby mommy or my baby daddy. So you all have a child together. Is F is an adult in a residential institution. Um, so you are living in a, 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 a shelter. You are uh, what other kind, any other kind of residential institution where you're not living in a house by yourself, but you may be in a, um, in a drug rehab home, for example, where you are a resident in a drug rehab space. So if there is any kind of abuse that's happening within a drug rehab space, for example, that is now classified in this law. Um, so if you are a resident in a, 
resident if you are an adult in a residential institution and the respondent is the owner or employee of the institution because you know we've heard on several occasions about situations where owners or employees or work play, work, people who are working abuse you another example is if you are in a um a, um oh gosh a home a home for the aged so you're in a home for the aged and we have heard examples of people in home for the age beating the, the, the elderly that are there. A worker is beating the elderly or something like that. The law now takes into consideration and considers that as domestic violence also. And you can do something about that, whether it's a volunteer or an employer or anything like that. All right. So um, that's part of it. Above, remember there were some definitions above that I said we would get to a little later. So one of them is relative above because we were talking about you can be, as long as you are classified as a relative of the person who you are saying is abusing you, you can go to the police. So what is classified as a relative in Trinidad and Tobago according to the domestic violence law? A relative could be um, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, stepfather, stepmother, father-in-law, mother-in-law, son, daughter, grandson, um, granddaughter, stepson, stepdaughter, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, brother, sister, half-brother, half-sister, stepbrother, stepsister, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, aunt, uncle, aunt-in-law, uncle-in-law, niece or nephew or cousin. So any of those is considered as a relative. So any of those people who are abusing you, whether they live in the same house or not, whether they are, those people are classified as your relative and you can now go to the court, you can now go to the uh, 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 police and say, hey, this relative of mine is abusing me and uh, I want you to do something about it, right? So those are some of the clear, the new definitions that were not there in the Domestic Violence Act before now. Um, as it says here, a re uh, residential institution means any premise other than a hospital or medical institution used for housing or caring for. So it could be a... Um, Anywhere you're caring for somebody with a disability, with a mental or physical disability, or elderly, as I said before. Now, um, when I started, I said there are two categories of people that this law refers to. It's the respondent, which is the person who I am claiming is abusing me. And the other person is the applicant, meaning the person who is applying to the court or going to the police and saying, I am being abused. And an applicant, for example, is anybody who can apply on my own behalf. Now, this is something that's also critical because this is new. They did not have this. Um, the, before now, the applicant could have only been the person who is being abused. Right? Before now, the applicant could have really only been the person who is being abused. But now they have extended that law to include the applicant being the person who applies on their own. So I am applying for myself. It could also be on whose behalf an application is made, meaning I am applying on behalf of somebody else. And a little later down, you would see who can apply on behalf of who or um, anybody who's applying on behalf of another person. So the law has now expanded to allow for a protection order to be given to the person who is in, who is being abused. But if you are in certain categories, which we will look at below, you can also apply for a protection order on behalf of somebody else who is being abused even if they they make it's possible that they can't do it for themselves, or they may be in a situation where well they may be in a situation where they they don't really want to, or they may they may be in a situation where they physically can't do it for themselves. So that is critical.
As I said before, a child means anybody under the age of 18 who is not married. So if you are under the age of 18 and you are married, the rules are a little different for you because they don't classify you as a child anymore. Once you've been married, you're in adult category, but a child is anybody who is 18 years and who's under the age of 18 and has not been married. Right, so let me go down a little bit to find some of the other areas that I wanted to highlight. As I said, I did not want to be too long with this live. Yes, so let me go to this part. The definition of domestic violence, because this is critical. This is absolutely critical. The, in the old law, um, the, the definition of domestic violence was very, was relatively narrow. And what they've done now is this law basically says, because this law is used to amend an old act, it is actually telling you where you see this word before in the old act, you take, you take out these words and you replace it with these other words. All right. So domestic violence before, they are saying you are supposed to, uh, you know what, I should have pulled up the original act so that you would have seen the original um, wording for this. Let me see if I can pull it up really, really quickly. Please forgive me. I'm going to try to pull it up from the article that I wrote so that you would see what the entire definition is. So you would see what the entire definition is. I'm using my cell phone to pull it up. Let's see here. Uh, okay, so the new law basically says that um, domestic violence refers to any physical, sexual, emotional, or psychological or financial abuse committed by a respondent against a person who is in a domestic relationship with the respondent. So that is what the new law defines domestic violence as, any physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, or financial abuse committed by a respondent against a person who is in a domestic relationship with a respondent. And before, remember I told you it was critical to understand when you say domestic relationship, that is why they, they went on and on and on and on above to define all of the different kinds of domestic relationships that we are talking about above, which includes the spouse the non, or the former spouse, the child, the, the visiting person, the, the, the um, family member, the relative, all of those things are now classified in domestic violence. Now, what is critical, and I think probably the most important part of this new act, is the expansion of the definition of emotional and psychological abuse. This may be the most important part of it. Because before it was very, very limited. Before it was very, very, very limited. But now, and this is the critical part, this is the part that may be the difference between life and death in future circumstances, because this is the part where many of us don't even know that the law now includes those kinds of actions against um, those kinds of actions against us. Okay, so it includes any act, omission, or a pattern of behavior of any kind the purpose of which is to undermine the emotional or mental well-being of a person who is in a domestic relationship with the respondent doing any of what I'm about to read. One, intimidation by the use of abusive or threatening language. Intimidation by the use of abusive or threatening language is one. Two, giving offensive material to that person or leaving it where it can be found by or brought to the attention of the person. What does that mean? If they send you, if they send anything 
that you they know is going to be offensive, that is going to be traumatic, that is going to be anything like that. I mean, you see on TV with, with um, serial killers and that kind of thing, they may put your kill the cat and put the carcass of the cat in front of your door so that they know you find it, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Any offensive, giving offensive material to that person or leaving it where it could be found. Three, following the person from place to place. So you are following or the person is following you from place to place. You go down the road, you turn around, the person is there. You're in your office, you turn around, the person is there. You go on the shop, you turn around, the person is there. Following the person, right? Depriving the person of the use of his property. It is mine. You cannot stop me from using it. It is my computer. It is my phone. It is my uh, car. It is my whatever it is. Emotional abuse is classified as depriving a person from using their property, whatever it may be. It may be simple, it may be big, it may be small, but they know when they hide it from you or they know that when they um, tell you you can use it or when they do whatever, all of those things, that is now classified as emotional abuse. The surveilling, watching or besetting by any means of the person or of the place where the person resides, works, carries on business or happens to be. You know, surveillance again, everywhere you go, they're watching. Or they could physically be there watching or it could be by any means, meaning they put up a camera and watching you. See what I'm talking about? All of these things were not included in the acts before. So this is now new. And, and it could be by your house, where you work, by your church, anywhere they know that you're supposed to be there. If they set up a process of surveying, watching, or besetting you, that is now classified as emotional abuse. Interfering or damaging the property of the person. Now that is clear. That is clear. Uh, the forced confinement of the person, they lock you in the house and they tell you you can't come out or lock in the room and say you can't come out. Lock the door of the car or you're in the car driving and because the person has a car that is a relatively new car that has automatic lock, when they lock the door from their side, from the driver's side, you cannot come out of the car. That's an example of forced confinement. Making unwelcome or intimidatory contact with the person by any means, including personal, verbal, or by gesture, letter, telephone, or electronic means. Any kind of contact. Any kind of contact. Now, this one is a new one that is critical. Disseminating intimate images of the applicant or a child of the applicant electronically or by any other means. In local parlance, in terms where you understand it, revenge porn. So all of those videos, all of those pictures that some of you be sharing on Facebook and sharing on WhatsApp that you know that the person who is in the picture or in the video did not give you permission or did not give the ex permission to share and the person now goes and shares them by any means that is now classified as emotional abuse and they can then go to court and be penalized uh, they can get a protection order those things as a result of that or it could be making unwelcome or intimate intimidatory contact with or acting in any manner described above towards the person's child or dependent of the person, towards a spouse or former spouse of the person, towards a cohabitant or former cohabitant of the person, towards a relative of the person, towards a person who is in a visiting or dating relationship, or a person who is in a close relationship with the 
individual. So they do not have to do, the abuser does not have to do all of these things to the person only if they do it to any of these other people relating to the person any of these other people relating to the person, it is still classified as emotional abuse. And this is, this is one of the most critical parts of this new law that I wanted you to, um, that I wanted you all to understand and to be very clear about, very, very clear. In addition to all of those things above, um, it is also classified as emotional abuse if they are preventing person from making or keeping in connection with their family or friends. That is something you hear people talk about all the time. The abuser now tell you you can't go down by your mommy or you can't go out with your friends. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do any of these other things because they are now in control. Or there is this broad-based final encapsulating um, clause that says if they do any other controlling, threatening, intimidating, or coercive behavior towards the person or the person's child or dependent, then they are classified as being emotionally abusive. And that is critical. I really, really wanted to spend some time going over those because we are now in a situation where these are all relatively new definitions. These are all relatively new acts. These are all relatively new things that are in the law that were not there before. Um, quickly, as it relates to the, a guardian, because one of the things we would see a little later down is that a, a parent or a guardian can apply for a protection order on behalf of a child. So a guardian, of course, we know a parent is biological mother or father, but they've also used a guardian. And guardian could mean a person appointed to be guardian by deed or will or by order of court to be over the child. A person who has custody of a child within the um, family law, so you've been given custody of a child, you've gone through the legal system and the children's authority or whoever says, okay, I'm giving you custody of this child. Any person who is in the opinion of the court has a responsibility for a child. And you see this last one? This last one is important because it could be any person who has a responsibility for a child. And that is a catch all um, clause. So teachers, because while the child is in school, you have the responsibility for the child, you are in this. Neighbor who mommy and daddy send the child up by the neighbor to, to, to let the neighbor watch the child for two, three hours, according to this, you are classified as a guardian because for those two, three hours, you are responsible for that child. Sunday school, Sabbath school teacher, because the parents are not there and they've left you with their child for the hour, two hours, Sunday school or Sabbath school, you are a person who the court would say is, has a responsibility for that child. And because you have a responsibility for that child, it means if you recognize that that child is being abused or that child is witnessing abuse, that's another thing. I wonder if I could find it here quickly. Um, I may find it a little later, but there's also a part of the law that says that you are classified as being emotionally abusive to a child if the child is in the presence of abuse. So you probably not doing the child anything, right? You not doing the child anything. But when you and the mother or the father, when there is the big cuss out or fight out or whatever or the actual abuse or the beat up is happening, the child is right there in the room, then according to this law, the child is considered as being 
emotionally abused and you can also be charged for the emotional abuse of the child even though you have not laid one hand on the child. Another part of it is that even if the child is not in the room, but the child is in a place where there is a possibility that the child can see the abuse, then you can be charged for emotional abuse of that said child. So the child may not be in the room, in the room where the abuse is happening, but the child is in another room where all they need to do is open a door or they are hearing through the walls what is happening. That is also classified as abuse of the child. Okay, so let me just say quickly here, application for a protection order can be made by a person in a domestic relationship with the respondent on the grounds that the domestic that the respondent engaged in domestic abuse as domestic violence as we identified above a child who is under the age of 16 um, also can apply for a protection order through a parent or guardian remember we were talking about parent or guardian or a person with responsibility for the child. So if the child is under the age of 16, then the child needs somebody else to apply on the child's behalf. Um, it could be a, an adult member of the child, of the household. So I realized that um, my sister and she boyfriend always, they're fighting and always they're cussing and carrying on and always beating he, always beating she up or she always beating he up or whatever. And I realized that even if them, they're big and crazy and they're doing what they want to do, they their business, but they always have the five-year-old child around in the middle of this. And I don't like how that's happening. I don't like how they're exposing the child to that. I can now, as an adult living in that house, can say to the court, I think that this child is being abused because he or she is 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 witnessing this or he or she might actually be abused any other adult in the household can apply for a protection for the child or the children's authority so maybe you don't want to do it because you don't want to get involved but you could send a little call to the children's authority and say hey children's authority this is what happening all you need to come and check this out the children's authority by law is required to check it out by law the children's authority is required to check it out and then if they realize what is happening means the child is being abused either directly or indirectly then the children's authority can apply for the protection order on behalf of the child if the child is under the age of 16. If the child is 16 or older, then the child can apply. So 16 or older means 16, 17 years old. Then the child big enough, according to this law, to actually go to the court before the court, go to the police, go to the court and apply for the protection order on their own behalf. Um, again, an adult in a residential institution or a dependent may apply for a protection order on their behalf. So if it is that um, we put gran granny, in a home and we realize them in the home for the age they are treating granny, then I could apply for a protection order um, on behalf of granny, right? So that can happen. Also a police officer, a probation officer, a social worker, the children's authority, or any person in the opinion of the court is acting in the interest of a child may also apply for a protection order on behalf of the child. So it's anybody, everybody. We are no longer in a situation where the law says only certain people can do it. We are now in a situation where anybody, as long as you realize a, this ain't good, this ain't working out. We should not be exposing the child to this, to that or the other. Then 
we can do it on their behalf or we could call the police or we could call children's authority by the way so there's children's authority but there's also within the police service there's a child protection unit of the police service that so you can call them directly and the police service now has a gender-based violence unit within the police service. So if you are going to the police station or you are calling the police station and you don't want to talk to some random police that is just sitting there, you can ask them specifically to speak with somebody who is in the child protection unit if who you are dealing with, if what you're dealing with refers to a child or you want to talk to somebody in the gender-based violence unit if you are speaking specifically about a gender-based violence issue, right? So that is absolutely critical. That is absolutely critical that you know that these options are there. And I think, let me see, I think that may be it in terms of the pieces that are absolutely critical. I mean, it, it goes into a lot of other things, it goes into a lot of other things where different things were modified, different things were edited, different things were taken out and replaced and, and stuff like that. So this is actually an act, a law that you can get if you go online. You can get this law if you want me to send it to you directly because I have it on my computer. I can send it to you directly or you can just search new domestic violence um, law, Trinidad and Tobago, and it should come up it would come up. I think that this is it. I don't, um, I'm not seeing anything else that I think is absolutely critical for this. So let me just go back to the top so you see what it looks like. And again, this is the law that was ascended to in July 2020, so one of our newest laws. And I just thought it was important for us to go through it a little bit. I just thought it was important for us to um, just get a sense of what's happening so that we now know what the situation is, so that we now know what we can do. Now, if there are any questions, you can type the questions in the chat. If there are no questions, then that's it. I will just jump out. I will just jump out um, of this Facebook Live because my plan is not for it to be very, very long. If there are other things you would like me to talk about, other laws or other, anything that you would like me to discuss, I don't mind researching it a little bit and discussing it, um, discussing it with you. So Nitha asks, are the officers in the gender-based unit division professionally trained to treat with these sensitive issues? Um, the official, <laughs> answer is uh, yes. The official answer is yes, because remember this gender-based unit um, was introduced very early this year and the commissioner of police, when they introduced it, said that they were going to go through some very rigorous training and so forth. Now, I cannot confirm that that actually happened, so I'm not going to put my neck on a block for that. I can confirm, though, that the officers that are part of the child protection unit, the officers that are part of the child protection unit, because I did, um, I did in 20, I think 2014, 2015, I did an assessment of the child protection system in Trinidad and Tobago. I was a consultant that was hired by the um, Ministry of Gender Affairs. Actually, I was hired by UNICEF but working through the Ministry of Gender Affairs to do the child protection assessment of Trinidad and Tobago. And at that time, the, the child protection unit of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, they were actually going through their training and that kind of thing at that time. And that training was very, very rigorous. To even be an officer there, you needed to go through um, psychometric testing. So you can just pick up and say, hey, I want to be in the child protection unit. No, you have to apply, but you have to go through the testing and you have to go through the training and all of that stuff. So I know for a fact that that happened as it related to the children, to the child protection unit. I would assume that something similar happened as it relates to the gender-based violence unit, but I honestly cannot confirm that it happened. I would put my neck on a block more for the children's the, the child protection unit because I knew it was happening when it was happening. So are there any other questions? Are there any other concerns? Are there any other anything, anything else you want to talk about well, about this act? 
Uh, Nita said, I asked a question bearing in mind that some children need protection from the people in the very homes where they live. And you are 100% correct. It is um, a sad situation. And as a matter of fact, now that we are in COVID, now that we have the new normal, now that we have um, children are no longer going to school, because school used to be a safe haven for many children, but that safe haven is not there anymore. And, you know, I am seeing videos online, for example, and we laugh about it. Eh? We're seeing videos online where the children are doing their Zoom classroom meetings and mommy and daddy is right behind them. And mommy and daddy right behind them with a belt in their hand. And I'm like, oh my God, we are now. And you know, we, we're joking about it and we're having skits and parodies about it and whatever. But I am thinking, oh my God, we have now left these children at home with their abusers. At least, at least when they went to school, there was eight hours of the day when they were not with their abuser. But now we've put them in a space where they are with their abuser. And on top of all of that, the abuser is now there responsible for their education. And that is a recipe for disaster. As a matter of fact, it's one of the reasons why at the last sitting of the assembly, one of the things I spoke about was the fact that I think that our, our monitoring within the schools should be within the homes now, the schools monitoring homes. So you have the social workers or the guidance councils and so forth. There needs to be a system that is very clear where we do more monitoring of these children at home. And particularly if the teachers are now picking up things, and there needs to be a very, very clear process on how they should treat with it, who they need to call, what do they need to do. That needs to be very, be very clear so that nobody is thinking, what do I do? The answer should be very, very, very clearly outlined to the teachers, to the social workers, to the um, guidance counselors and all of that. Yeah, so I'm actually using a new um, streaming thing now. The one I was using before was acting up, so I've kind of decided to switch streaming devices or services. So I'm using this now, and I kind of, I kind of like this one. So if there are no other questions, if there are no other questions, then I think that's it. I'm really trying my best to not let this, um, let these lives go too, 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 too long. Oh, by the way, very quickly, because I don't think I said it. One of the things that we can do, um, the Domestic Violence Act says that in addition to the, to the person, the perpetrator, the respondent, the abuser um, getting charged and so forth, one of the things that we can do is to get protection orders. Uh, protection order, according to the law, and I want to read it from my phone because I don't have it on the um, thing you to see. A protection order can be made by the court and that protection order makes it illegal for the respondent to contact the person either directly or indirectly. It be between a certain amount of distance between the person. Um, of course, the new act now expands the range of individuals who can apply for a protection order and it includes people who are in domestic relationships, which we spoke about, we defined earlier, children under the age of 16 or children over the age of 16 or any um, resident in an institution and that kind of thing. So it means that's what the protection order says. This person is not allowed to contact you, is not allowed to come in a certain um, distance from you. This person is supposed to stay away from you. And in many instances, the protection order also um, requires the person if there is need for um, financial assistance. So, you know, it may be the father and the father is the only breadwinner in the house. The order would also say, but you also still need to take care of your child. So you still need to deposit whatever amount of money in the bank account or in this, whatever is the arrangement that needs to be made. One quick thing though, before I um, forget, um, one of the organizations in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly in Tobago, that deals with domestic violence is what is known as Women of Substance Tobago. So I want you to go search in online, Women of Substance Tobago, Women of Substance Tobago, and um, search for them. Uh, I know that they are currently, um, they've been working very, very hard at providing services for women who are, so women are substance. They've been working very, very hard at providing um, 
support, for example, I have actually attended one of their, one or more than one, I can't remember, of their support group session. So they actually had, well, of course, this was before COVID, um, one of their support group sessions where um, people who've been abused, you could come and actually get support. So the organization does that. The organization I know have been trying their best to get a, a, a home so that they could be a space of rescue for women, um, women and children who are being abused so that there's somewhere to run to, somewhere to house them if the situation is really, really bad. And I know that they've been working on that. So it's a look for them, look for them, uh, look for them. I truly appreciate this vital information and pray that sensitive issues remain confidential and sensitive to the protection of all those being abused. I completely agree. That has been one of the biggest issues in Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to any kind of abuse, whether it's child abuse, domestic abuse. Like you shouldn't, because we've had situations where, you know, somebody to the police to, um, to, report an abuse and before the person even reach back home the abuser knows about it because it's partners with the police and that kind of thing and we can't have that happening that, that is a that is a that's a ridiculous situation to be in and it's a it's an unsafe situation to be in because that could result in death unfortunately uh Nita is asking can those of us who are abroad be a part of this virtually yes i think i i think you can uh, so i would recommend that you search for facebook women of substance tobago women of substance tobago and if so you would find the organization there if you don't and i i am not sure if she's on the live and i don't care whether she's on the live or not i'm putting her name out there because she needs to be recognized the person who is running this her name is miss onika mars so if you don't if you find women of substance to be the, the chairperson of that organization is miss onika mars and miss onika mars has a has an amazing story of having gone through abuse herself having gone through abuse herself she recognized that she needed to help others survive the way she was able to survive. So look for Onika Mars online, um, look for Women of Substance online, and you would be able to link with them, with her and with the entire organization. Or you could look at, um, contact me. Um, my organization is Imani Beth Knesset Foundation. You could search for it online and you would be able to find, I could link you with, um, I can link you with Onika or with any of the others who are here doing this great work. All right, guys, so if there are no other questions, if there are no other comments, um, thank you all so much. Even if you missed the beginning of the live, you can go back, it would be available. You can go back and um, view it. You can um, share it with other people who might be interested. Remember what we did is basically go through the new domestic violence laws in Trinidad and Tobago. Because, hey, we need to know, we definitely need to know what the new law says, since the new law actually gives us quite a bit of protection, um, at least on the books. So we are going to have to try to figure out how to actually make it work. But on the books, we are seeing the um improvement in what the law says all right folks so thank you all so much thank you thank you thank you for tuning in share the live again have you can have watch parties and that kind of thing you can contact me directly if you have any questions or concerns and we go from there have a blessed night folks and be blessed be blessed be safe remember we're still in the midst of covid so don't go crazy out there you still need to wash your hands and wear your mask and hand sanitize and all of that good stuff all right see you have a blessed evening Bye.